before Sandy, Irene hit New Jersey. I think it was the first direct landfall storm for many, many years. And it didn't reach category one status, but nonetheless, it, it came ashore and it caused some tidal flooding and, and some heavy rains. I remember that particular storm. We had 11 inches of rain during Irene. But we had had, again, along the shore, a series of miscues, if you will, with a lot of hype about storms that were coming and never materialized. So I think a number of people were not as concerned or alerted as they probably should have been. Life is great here in Monmouth County and at the Jersey Shore. Monmouth County offers a number of things. We have beaches, we have farms, we have cities. We have 650,000 residents approximately and county government oversees a number of operations. We have 65 departments. There aren't that many places like here where you have these big boardwalks and that's part of the culture of the Monmouth County shoreline. It's the best county in the state of New Jersey and I truly do believe that. And I think a lot of people do believe that. I remember I was in a meeting and our emergency management chief asked to see me for a couple minutes when I came out of the meeting. He was talking about a tropical depression just out of the Caribbean called Sandy. Been downgraded to a tropical storm and then very quickly became a category one storm again. The forecasted track started as a normal hurricane would follow the Atlantic seaboard and then turn out into the ocean. And I really didn't think anything of it until he showed me the European model, which showed all four lines coming directly to the Jersey Shore. As the storm got closer, this left turn into the coastline became more and more probable. Two days before landfall, we became very, very worried that that was going to be how the storm was going to move. At that point, the window is very short. Leading up to the storm, everybody had an idea that this was for real, not as maybe as severe as it ended up becoming. I think the confusion of whether Sandy was a hurricane, a tropical storm, a superstorm, or, or what it was actually going to be was an issue. I think a lot of people maybe did not take it as seriously when it was recategorized from a hurricane to a tropical storm. But what it did is when it took that devastating word of a hurricane away, okay, it took people a little off guard. We had a lot of residents say, Oh, we're not going to leave when we evacuate. We don't think it's going to be as bad as Irene was last year. But we continually, led by our Office of Emergency Management, led by Sheriff Sean Golden, he took those precautions to continually notify and alert towns, to alert their residents that this was going to be something abnormal. You really need the confidence and you really need people to believe that when you say, this is it, that this is it and you need to leave. But at the end of the day, we all know people, they feel comfortable in their home and they were staying there and they did. And in the emergency operations center, I remember because this was at a point where anyone who wanted to be evacuated was evacuated. Anybody that needed to be sheltered was sheltered. And what was left was a kind of an eerie sense of there was nothing left to do but watch this storm come over the county. It felt like you were wearing the air that you could actually slice through the air it was so humid. You saw the seagulls all disappear. Regardless of how much we had implored them to leave early, and there were those who chose not to. And then as they recognized that they saw the forecast, they saw basically on television what they could expect and how horrific it was going to be. You saw many people at that point make a last minute decision to be evacuated. In the course of that evening, we received 8,100 911 calls in our Sheriff's Office Communication Center. That was a record number. Keep in mind that the majority of fire and EMS resources at that time were volunteer. So a lot of those rescues were being affected by volunteers whose homes were also being damaged, whose families were also evacuated. And they have their own life that probably was affected in most cases. So they were dealing with their personal life as like we did on the county level. You know what? I've had a lot of people volunteer buses. I can't use those buses. My fellow commissioners, all our county workers, they were out there working, but you know, there's a personal side of it. They have families home. People that, you know, answered the call, if you will, under dire personal circumstances, who came to work every single day, not knowing, you know, what their homes look like. Out of the seven counties that were impacted along uh, the New Jersey coast, uh, Monmouth County had zero deaths in our county. Which was really remarkable considering the damage that was done and how quickly it was done. One thing that I will say to our first responders, the way that they were conducting the rescues overnight, 
people needed to be rescued. So first responders, emergency responders, even our public works and engineering office had crews out in military style vehicles rescuing people who had not gotten out before the water came up. When the winds got to storm force winds, you know, 40, 45 miles per hour, we stopped all evacuations, stopped all rescues, and pulled all the emergency responders back to their stations. There comes a time when you have to pull in and you have to pull all of your safety people in, you have to shut the door, you have to batten down the hatches, and then you have to ride out the storm. And then you go to sleep, not knowing what's going to occur. And of course, the wind, the rain, the noise, it kept me up most of the night and, you know, I was nervous. And then at that point we were receiving call after call after call begging for rescues or evacuation assistance. At that point, we, we had to make that decision and tell people, we're sorry, we can no longer come and assist you in evacuating. And in fact, we suggest you now hunker down. We suggest you stay off the roads. It's no longer safe for you to leave your home. Your safest place is in your home. Find the safest place within your home to stay. Contact your family now and let them know that you are unable to get out. I've never felt that kind of energy before. It felt like there was a giant on the outside of the shelter pounding on the building. It was very unnerving. Pounding on the building, and at any minute, you felt like it was gonna get in. The county forces gathered at the Emergency Operations Center and our OEM coordinator, Mike Obergaard, who was directed by Sheriff Sean Golden, set about what it is that we needed to do. Shelters were set up. To see the way they set it up at Monmouth University and they made the quality of these people stay feel comfortable. Our Office of Emergency Management and our Sheriff Sean Golden, he deserves a ton of credit for the way that he put this all together. We had evacuated a known 72,000 residents. We had a shelter, 1,800 of those residents in our shelters at Monmouth University in Brisbane. One thing that we've learned, and which I had to learn myself, was how fast water comes. One moment it's dry, the next minute it's too late. The storm surge enters the inlets too, right? So in the inlets it has less resistance, so it's even coming faster and higher. And then the next moment is when we opened up the door to daylight. And then to see the devastation, and that was just an unreal moment. We realized at that moment that it was uh, much more horrible than what we thought it was going to be. There was so much debris, you couldn't walk down the street. Cars were strewn, there were basically puddles, liquor bottles everywhere, furniture everywhere, TVs. You could hear the hissing of gas. But to stand at that moment, there were no birds, there was no sound, there was no nothing in this utter field of devastation. And there were pools at our feet that had fish in them, sea fish in them. There was a sense of not knowing what to do next, sense of shock, because you're not supposed to see homes cut in half or flipped over upside down. And when we got to the shore, the amount of sand, there was more sand on Ocean Avenue than there was, I think, on the beach. When the storm was over on Monday morning, um, this highway was filled with sand and debris up to about my chest. All the boats were up on the streets, just damaged house after damaged house. Looking at this and like, just feeling the hopelessness of what it was, then driving down to the shore and then looking at all our beachfronts. I do remember being down there and saying, it's never gonna come back. We in the county, we had sustained winds of 75 miles an hour. The water levels at Sandy Hook, the gauge actually got destroyed when the water levels reached 11 feet over sea level. The western part of the county, a lot of wind, a lot of tree damage, power lines came down. We had 92% of our residents, that's over 500,000 residents in Monmouth County that were without power. 
Most of them would experience no power for almost up to 10 days. The longest outages lasted up to 16 days. It certainly made communications a little bit more difficult. Reaching out for people, notifying you know, our workforce what was going on became a little bit more complicated by the fact that there was no power. We had to get to these people's places, town halls, with no light, no electricity, and talk to them face to face like the old days. And we did that. Can everybody hear me right now? You have to remember trying to get gas at the gas stations at that time was difficult also because the gas stations didn't have backup generators. So when the electricity went out, they had no way of getting the fuel out of the ground. Generators became a very hot commodity very quickly, but they couldn't run credit card machines. So unless you had cash, you couldn't buy gas. You had complete towns that had no power anywhere. People that probably won't be able to see this right now, they're in the dark and they feel that the whole state is like this. And that's probably where Monmouth County, one of the most important ways they helped us was being able to get residents fuel to keep those generators running. When the storm hit, the county response, I'd say that night they were on the phone with us. What do you need? I contacted every mayor in the Bay Shore and said that we're there for them. And let's meet, let's bring our groups together from our public works, from our engineering department, from our sheriff's office, from our OEM office, and what can we do to help you and assist you with all the resources that we have. The community support from, you know, from the county and from the adjoining towns was like nothing I ever expected. We had more supplies than we knew what to do with. People need help, we can do something about it, and we can do something about it fast. A long-term planning had paid off. We had done a number of drills and everybody sort of knew what they needed to do. But I don't know that any of us were prepared for the breadth and scope of what actually happened to us. Days after the storm, it's hard to, to stop residents from wanting to go back to their home. As severely damaged as it may be, they want to see what happened. We recognize that this is an urgent, desperate situation and people are hurting. We know we're trying to get you back there. Seabright is not ready to be reoccupied. So, um, we are going Imagine to being a mayor of a town. People are relying on you. Help us through this. This is your job. This is why we put you there. And your house is destroyed. And this, the nice muddy one, is my house. You can see my water line, right? That's, that's in the, that is in the inside of my house, too. In the sheriff's office, uh, I had over 13 sheriff's officers that lost their house, but still insisted on coming to work and working through it. Every single one, every single one of these people has been boots on the ground as they say. It's day one. Day one. And I want to tell you, you guys should be proud to be Monmouth County residents. We are at the bridge to re-enter a community here that's been affected. Seabright, this um, community is, is able to go back into their area today. We want you to be safe. Seabright has not experienced any fatalities, any injuries. Let's keep it that way. We want to get back in our house as soon as possible. I do too. I mean, uh, everyone's doing the best they possibly can. I mean, we've got a really bad situation here. Unfortunately, there's sometimes some bad things that occur, and there are certain situations where people are getting taken advantage of, and that's where consumer affairs comes in. He should be ashamed of himself. He's charging $8 for a bag of ice. How much is a bag normally? Dollar two. something, $2. Yeah. People doing this to people in need, it's terrible. In terms of contractors or other vendors that weren't honest or overpromised and underdelivered, the State Department of Consumer Affairs as well as the County Department of Consumer Affairs, our Weights and Measures Department was out right away making sure that, you know, as soon as there was electricity and gas pumps could start working, that a gallon of gas was a gallon of gas. The federal resources were super when it came to recovery. As far as response, I think that was pretty much on the locals to handle the response. You cannot depend on the state and the federal government for the first few days. They will not be here. You have to be prepared for these types of emergencies within your own parochial level. It was always three forms of government. It was always the state, the county, and the local. I kind of feel that we came together now, but it started at that period of time. Three or four days after Sandy, you think, okay, this is bad. 
we've survived. After our morning briefing, I took a nap on the couch to catch up on some sleep. I woke up, there were three inches of snow on the ground. And I'm just thinking, what else? The only thing missing is Godzilla. You know, Sandy hit October 29th and a week later, we have snow on the ground. And caused down power lines again, additional trees to fall. At the time, the presidential election was to take place approximately one week after the storm hit. We sort of didn't know the first thing to do in terms of proceeding with an election when you can't reach anyone, talk to anyone, what polling locations were even in existence anymore. Now, just because New Jersey was impacted by Superstorm Sandy didn't mean that our whole political process should come to a screeching halt. We had to proceed. The election was going to take place. Everyone worked together and sent a clear message that every single voter was going to be able to cast their vote. And I think that was a fantastic moment uh, in New Jersey history uh, and in American history. And that was really sort of laid the groundwork for all of the election emergency preparedness that we do to this day. This firehouse was, was damaged in the storm. However, um, it's really been a base of operations. We're the Seabright Firehouse and we're cooking for all the firemen, the cops, and the construction workers. I'm the head chef at Woody's right next door. So I'm part of the town like everyone else here. I saw the devastation in Seabright and I needed to do something. Having people in town, the rescue workers, the public works people, clearing the sand, getting the utilities back up, that was probably the first order of business. And these guys were in town with nowhere to go to get food, water, anything. Keep them in town, keep them fed, and keep them working. Let's get this thing rolling. And we had pickup points all over the place where people would drop off food and then volunteers would then drive it over to Seabright because nobody was allowed into Seabright, but they were allowed to deliver the supplies that we needed. People needed a shovel, people needed diapers, people needed this, that, the other thing. We supplied it. You can put them in bags and then just put them right over here. All of our Office of Emergency Management's in all of our municipalities. They were sleeping nights in and nights out at their firehouse, at their first aid. They were coming together for their community. We formed a nonprofit called Seabright Rising. The sole goal for that was to give money and supplies to residents in need. It was things like this that we did that was ongoing long after our relief effort. There were many local organizations created just because of Sandy, just to assist people that were devastation. The volunteers that were coming into Union Beach after the storm, and it was all walks of life. There were a group of kids that rented a U-Haul truck. They wanted to cook. You know, they just wanted to come in and help feed people. And there were many, many instances of that across Monmouth County, people helping one another out that really probably didn't, other than weaving in the driveway, really didn't have much in common, even though they lived in the same neighborhood. I drop off supplies for them, pick things up, give them word of mouth, because I am from the community, telling them where the help is needed. The Seabright Rising operated at a much more personal level than, like, say, a Red Cross. They're such big organizations that they aren't able to really find out like the personal stories of who's in need where, what these actual people need. We knew the people who were impacted the most. We knew the town. We knew what needed to be done. Why are you volunteering? Uh, because there are so many people in need and it's the least that you can do for your neighbors. And they were bringing water, they were bringing food, clothes, whatever people need, because people's lives were completely and totally destroyed. I tell you, when it chips are down, American people, they're around. Yeah, we are. Yeah. We well, thank tried you very much. No Here you go. Thank Just you. Embedded, embedded. Some of the students that didn't have school because they were without power, delivering food, delivering water. This is the headquarters of Rebuild Recover right now. We've been distributing and sorting through uh, donated supplies. There's 15 year olds with braces running stuff right now. It's crazy. I have a huge town that needs a tons of stuff. I'm gonna get it with And whatever it was they offered, whether they did a lot or a little, it meant something to everyone. You wanna carry your lunch? Thank you for everything.
Did something good come out of it? Our partnerships came out of it. We built partnerships that to this day last with our municipalities because of the way we came to their aid and helped them. The compare and contrast of Union Beach prior to Sandy and after Sandy. Prior to Sandy, it was, it was a small bungalow town. After Sandy, now you have these large homes. We have put more real estate value at risk after Sandy than we ever had before Sandy. And we're looking at communities that went from basically beach bungalow cottages to three-story elevated single homes in the same location. It really is night and day. We used to have families, generations, living in Union Beach. And now some of those generations are gone. They moved as a result of Sandy. We have for years been studying the movement of sand along our coast, how it changes over time, how it changes our ability to withstand storm damage. In Monmouth County, we had a pretty large-scale beach fill project. They take sediment from offshore, they pump them onto the shoreline, and they can actually elevate the shoreline by tens of feet. And they widen the beach, and they build a sand dune on the back of it that was designed to withstand a 100-year storm event, which Sandy exceeded, but the beach is held up just fine. So wherever we had the beach wide enough and high enough in Monmouth County, it prevented a lot of damage. So a lot of planning is now focused on restoration of these natural coastal lands. Our natural environmental features are helping us protect our communities. To build that close to the shoreline now, the homes are required to be up in the air above base flood elevations. But the streets are still in the same place, the utilities are still in the same place, which made us vulnerable. You know, we're still vulnerable in some places because we rebuilt the way we did. You can do everything you can to remediate damages and things of that nature but the ocean's the ocean. It's, uh, it's your friend one day and it's your biggest enemy the next. Could it happen again? Absolutely. But I will tell you that Monmouth County's stronger. I think it's better well-equipped today. I think it has a better plan today. And all these things come from the experience we learned from Sandy. That was the start of our united group of elected officials and county officials and doing all of our projects working together. And uh, you know, everybody's in doom and gloom, but you know, there's a lot of good people here having a good time in a bad situation, that's all. We have lots and lots of donations from wonderful people, from kids things to somebody donated bathing suits. I don't know. <laughs> And I worked in corporate kitchens and restaurants for nine years, and I've never had more fun since I started giving the food away. And especially in a time like this, man, every little laugh goes a long way. You gotta, you gotta count a personal victory as a win. So it's a lot of fun to be a part of. That is just an awesome jacket, though. I love, love that hoodie. I know that you always hear this Jersey Strong statement when this occurred. You know, I always say that we came first, Mom is strong. Not everything that came out of Sandy was negative. The way it reinforced everyone's sense of community, the pride, how the children handled it, how everyone handled it. You can make a difference, you just have to try. We're very thankful that they were there in our time of need. And all these years later, we didn't forget.